So with that, I wish you a good long weekend, and we will see you Monday morning. Let's We will convene at 9 a.m. for closing arguments and final instructions. Thank you so much. I'll rise for the jury. Just before 11 on this Thursday morning, day 14 of testimony, testimony is complete. The state rests its case. The defense rested its case earlier. Short testimony from Dr. Martin Tobin this morning. Tense moments for sure as we waited to see if Dr. Tobin would thread that needle and be able to talk about carbon monoxide uh, levels in George Floyd's blood without referencing this newly discovered test that the judge decided would not be allowed into testimony, into evidence, because uh, the state knew about this uh, line of testimony for some time, had the test result for 11 hours or so, uh, 11 months or so, but just didn't get those results. Uh, court is back in session. Okay, Mr. Chauvin, uh, you have the right to be present at all phases of the trial. That would actually include the charge conference. But basically, you'd be watching the lawyers and I wordsmithing the instructions, and I think you already have a copy. Uh, you want to be present for that, or are you willing to waive your presence? All right. Uh, we'd probably put any discussions on the record uh, just to memorialize what we've decided, and you're willing for us to do that without you present. Is that correct? Uh, any requests that have already been made by the attorneys as far as proposed instructions, that constitutes a motion for me to give those instructions to the jury. So there's no need for your lawyer to object to anything uh, because if I don't give anything your lawyer says, that's essentially denying the motion for that proposed instruction. The same thing is true for the state. Any of their proposed instructions memorialize their request. There's no need for an additional motion objecting to whatever I decide is the final instructions. So with that, um, also, we have all been talking about the appropriate way to deal with uh, questions from the jury. Occasionally, uh, jury questions will arise. I think our preference is that we not move the jury around uh, if we can avoid it, and also that we not have people coming and going from the government center. Um, since you will not be required to stay here at the government center while the deliberation is occurring. Uh, accordingly, our plan is that we do uh, any questions by Zoom. If you recall earlier when I brought back several of the jurors who had been selected to talk about the possible effect that Minneapolis City Settlement had, uh, that's how we would do jury questions. In other words, they would be able to see us, we would be able to see them. And when I say we, I mean the parties, yourself. Uh, but the jury, because they're anonymous, would not be broadcast to the outside world. And that would be our plan for how to answer uh, questions. Any questions that come to me from the jury, the first step is to talk to all the lawyers, get their input on what I, how I should answer it. Very often it is rereading certain instructions, but in any case, I will talk to all the lawyers, and after talking with them, formulate what my answer is going to be. That will be on the record, but it will be by Zoom. Are you fine with that arrangement since you don't have to be here? Uh, we would want you to be part of the Zoom, so you've got to be subject to uh, getting in front of a computer, basically. Uh, are you fine with that? All right. Uh, anything else uh, as far as before we go into the charge conference? Not from the state, Your Honor. Okay. No, Your Honor. All right. Uh, then we are off the record until Monday at 9 a.m. Thank you. So Monday at 9 a.m. is when closing arguments will be made and jury instructions will be issued, and then the jury gets to work, uh, perhaps uh, issuing a verdict as early as Monday and perhaps taking a week as the, or more, as the judge told the jury, to pack their bags and uh, pack for long. His quote was, if I were you, I would plan for long and hope for short. Uh, but it is up to the jury. Let's go to Joe Tamburino, our legal analyst throughout the trial. We are about 13 and a half days, 14 days of testimony, a very short uh, testimony from Dr. Martin Tobin. Uh, Joe, before we get to some thoughts on the overall trial and the overall evidence, as now we are complete with the testimony phase of this, uh, I think a lot of us are wondering, and perhaps there's no way to uh, know, uh, just how close were we to a mistrial here? I think we were very close, and I think it's extremely unfortunate 
that these significant legal arguments, and this was probably the most significant legal argument, is happening outside of the courtroom. That's a public courtroom. Uh, the public deserves to know. We have cameras in the courtroom. This is an open courtroom. It's not something that is a sensitive issue of a personal matter of a juror or a witness. These are legal arguments on mistrials and motions like that. So it's unfortunate that we weren't able to hear that. Is this stuff, I mean, a lot of these conversations that were going on over headset, is this something that the court reporter listens to and would then be a part of the permanent record of the trial? Yes, there's two parts. The headsets, which is what's called a bench conference, where you go up to the bench normally, except now with COVID, you do it by the uh, earphones and the microphone. That's all on the record. The court reporter is actively taking notes. However, chambers conferences are different. Sometimes a judge will bring in the court reporter or have a microphone going to the court reporter. Sometimes they won't. And we simply have no idea in this case what's been happening. Maybe the judge is putting this all on the court reporter record. Maybe not. We don't know. But the point is, is that in court, that's a public courtroom, and for legal arguments, they should really be happening out there. Well, as far as a motion for mistrial being renewed, we didn't hear it, so we don't know if it was made or if it was not, uh, or if it was an objection uh, in some other regard. So that we don't know. What we do know is that uh, Dr. Tobin was up very briefly. Do you think uh, this rebuttal testimony, uh, what do you make of it? Well, it fell flat because of the issue with did the doctor violate the court's order in mentioning that May 2020 uh, gas test on Mr. Floyd's blood. We know something happened. You're right. We don't know if an actual mistrial motion was made. I would imagine it was, but we don't know that for sure, again, because it wasn't an open court. However, we know that something went wrong because this rebuttal testimony was abbreviated. It was cut short. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, as far as the jury is concerned, I suppose it just makes today kind of a wash. The carbon monoxide testimony was not really significant testimony from Dr. Fowler yesterday. And if anything, as you pointed out yesterday, uh, if the jury believes that carbon monoxide poisoning was a significant issue in this case, they almost certainly have to convict Derek Chauvin of manslaughter in the second degree because who put George Floyd in a position to be near an exhaust pipe? That's all correct. That's why I thought, why recall a witness to talk about CO, carbon monoxide, when it's not that big of an issue and, in fact, right. helps the state? Because, you know, yeah, Mr. Chauvin put Mr. Floyd's head, his face, near the exhaust pipe. That doesn't help the defense. It's bewildering why they wanted to recall this witness just for the carbon monoxide issue. And now we have this could be a big problem. Yeah. Yeah, very interesting. Okay, let's talk about what happens next. The judge talked about a charging conference. What does that mean? That's very standard. That's where the judge sits down with the parties. Uh, the defendant does not have to be there. He could waive his appearance. And what occurs is you go over the jury instructions. This, these are the meat and potatoes of the case. This is where the judge says to the jury, this is the law. Here's what you must follow. Here's what the law says for each of the three counts. Here are the elements of each count. So it, it's important. It's very standard. It always happens this way. And both sides have already submitted their proposed jury instructions. So the judge will now go through everything and give them his final decision. Uh, jury instructions. How important are those instructions? How often do they deviate? Or, or are they specific about, you know, saying, well, you have to find this about this particular case, or are they more general in nature? Well, they are extremely important because you will see in closing arguments on Monday, both sides holding up those instructions and telling the jury what the law is because they will both rely on it. Uh, second, yes, they are mostly standard instructions. 
However, lastly, you can tailor them to your case. So the judge could say, well, normally this instruction reads this way. However, due to the unique circumstances of this case, I'm going to change X, Y, or Z. So they are mostly standard, but you can amend them or make some changes. And, and is this something normally that takes hours or days to work on? As you said, both sides have filed their uh, suggested jury instructions. Uh, this would take, I would imagine, an hour at most, mm -hmm. maybe two, uh, because both sides have already made their proposals. That's been part of the public file. The judge has had quite a long time to look at them. So I don't think this is going to take long at all. So, Joe, you look at this, and to a certain degree, now that I'm looking, it's 11 in the morning on Thursday, uh, and perhaps they thought today was going to take longer than it did, but, uh, you know, wh why wouldn't you just get going on this today? Why are, why are we waiting till Monday on this? Well, because the judge already told the jury that they'd have Friday off. I think if the judge would have known there would have been such a problem with Dr. Tobin's testimony being recalled again, he might have done that. The, the issue is, though, by having so many days, uh, that jury is going to be exposed to who know what in the media. I mean, we have this Brooklyn Center case. We have uh, media attention, obviously, on the Chauvin trial. So you're sort of putting things at risk that for basically almost four days, this jury is going to be out and about living their lives and who knows what they will be exposed to. Mm -hmm. It might be better just to go straight to closings on Friday. Yeah. As an attorney, do you, and, and I think the judge didn't want the jury to be working through the weekend. There's always a fear. I guess maybe you could talk to that. Is there a fear when you have a jury working over the weekend that they'll kind of uh, speed things along because, uh, you know, nobody wants to be sitting in a, in a jury room on Saturday or Sunday? There is that fear, but you have to balance that with ending the case before the jury finds out any type of information outside that they shouldn't be exposed to. Uh, personally and professionally, what I have always liked to do is go straight into closings. Now, in a big case like this, of course, you couldn't go straight into closings at 1 p.m. today, but you certainly could do it for tomorrow. And remember, the jury also has control of their schedule. So if they start working on Friday, and they work all day Saturday, they can say to the judge, you know what, we'd like to take off on Sunday, just hang out at the hotel, do whatever. They have control partly of their schedule. Um, but, you know, it's already been told to them that they're free till Monday, so you can't unring that bell. I suppose so, yeah. It is a long period of time to pass. Not that these jurors are going to forget about relevant points of the testimony. This trial has gone on now uh, uh, into 14 days of testimony, but it is interesting for sure well, to think like of all this time that's going to pass in between the last time you heard from a witness. Well, that's absolutely right. And think of this, Jason, what happens if a juror says, hey, I'm now available this weekend so I could go to my cousin's birthday party and they go to a birthday party tomorrow night or Saturday and they get sick. What happens if a couple of them get sick? I mean, we have a that's a long period of time to wait for closings. Yeah. There are two alternates as a part of this jury panel. There are 14 jurors who have been sitting in there. And this is something else we'll watch for on Monday, right, Joe? Because the alternates theoretically don't know that they are alternates. How does that process work? You're right. They do not know that they're alternates. They never know that they're alternates. And what will happen is the judge on Monday will give some brief instructions to the jury, part of the jury instructions, and then he will ask the state if they want to give a closing argument. Of course they will. After the state goes the defense, and after the defense goes the state's rebuttal argument. Then the judge will have some ending type of instructions, and then the judge will ex excuse the two alternates. Um, it's a tough situation because obviously these two people have sat through this whole trial, so I'm sure it's a little disappointing to them when it happens. But they will be excused right before the jury goes back to the deliberation room. Tr uh, typically and traditionally, the alternates are the last two jurors who are selected, but there's no law or rule that mandates that, correct? 
That's correct. Uh, normally it is the last two. However, a judge could say, in this case, I'm going to have the first two. Or the judge could say numbers seven and eight. Or the judge could say parties. At the end of this case, we're going to put all the names or numbers in a hat, and we're going to pick two randomly, and those will be the alternates. So we don't know what the judge ordered in this case, but you're right. Typically, it's the last two. Uh, this interesting uh, tidbit just shared uh, by Chow Shang, who is a reporter for the Star Tribune, took a look at how long juries have taken in some of the other more recent trials of former police officers. The uh, Geronimo Yanez case, uh, the jury was not sequestered. They deliberated over five days, 30 hours, and he was acquitted. And the Mohammed Noor jury deliberated over two days. They were sequestered, took 10 hours uh, to convict on two counts and acquit on one. So it does give you a sense for how long jurors tend to deliberate. Of course, this jury will be sequestered, which means they'll be in a hotel, Joe. Do they have a TV in their hotel room or do they take those TVs out? Or what do they do when you have a jury sequestered? Normally, they take all that out. I don't know what the judge has ordered in this case. He hasn't spoken of it. But normally, when you're sequestered, you're sequestered. Sometimes they allow some reading materials, but in terms of having a computer, a smartphone, anything like that, no, they're not going to have that. Now, the jury will have access to the bailiffs. There will be 24-hour security, and if they need to get a message to a family member or receive a message, that is easily doable. But normally, all of those things are removed. Okay. All right, we are done with the testimony in this trial so far. Testimony is done, closing arguments, all that remains. Joe, as you look back over this, uh, perhaps most watched, certainly the most watched trial in the history of the state of Minnesota because of uh, the subject matter for sure, but also because the trial was broadcast, uh, the entire trial broadcast and streamed for all of us to watch with our own eyes. I, I just wonder what your thoughts are now. Well, I think cameras are here to stay. I think they should be here to stay. It is a public courtroom, and I think this case has proven that, that they are important for the public to learn from what goes on in their judicial system. Also, the biggest takeaway for me is this was a trial about videos. Uh, the first time ever where you had expert witnesses primarily base their opinion on watching a video. Hmm. Body-worn cameras were the ultimate piece of evidence in this case. It's very unique, first time I've ever seen it, where the primary evidence for experts even were the videos. Yeah.